Union. The following is a sponsored program paid for by First Alliance Credit Union. Welcome to Good Money Moves featuring Jenna Tobble from First Alliance Credit Union and Andy Brownell. Here's Andy Brownell on Rochester's News Talk, 1340 KROC AM and 96.9 FM. Welcome to Good Money Moves. I'm Andy Brownell. It's News Talk, 1340 KROC AM and 96.9 FM. And of course, I'm joined by Jenna Tobble, the Director of Brand and Digital Member Experience at First Alliance Credit Union. Hello, Jenna. Good morning, Andy. I have another guest with me today. I have brought in our CEO, Mike Rosick, uh, to cover a really interesting topic today. But before we dig into that, I want to just give Mike a chance to say hi and share a little bit about himself for listeners who maybe haven't heard him on the show before. Hello. Thank you for that intro, Jenna. Of course, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO of First Alliance Credit Union. Um, I've been here now uh, six years, and I've been in the industry for just about 40 years. So um, I've seen a lot, um, and a lot of things happen, as you, as you might expect, all the things. But again, just glad to be here on the show and talk a little bit uh, more about um, you know the uh, Silicon Valley uh, bank collapse and what perhaps some uh, implications are for both, um, you know, our members and, you know, just the bank uh, banking system in general and, and things like that. So, again, thanks for you guys for having me today. Well, you bet. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, Jenna, maybe you want to explain what we're going to cover today. Yeah. So, as Mike mentioned already, we are going to be talking about a very hot topic um, that many of our listeners have probably heard a little bit about already, and that is the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and just for some context, so Silicon Valley Bank provided banking services to nearly half the country's venture-backed capital companies and more than 2,500 2, venture capital firms. So why this information is important to understand is because the clientele that Silicon Valley Bank catered to is part of the perfect storm that really led to its collapse within 48 hours. Um, and we are going to dig deep into this topic today. That's why I have invited Mike here. He is very knowledgeable about this situation. Um, but just for context, you know, so when we talk about who were the the clientele of Silicon Valley Bank. We're talking about companies that you probably are very well aware of and have heard of before, like Roku, Pinterest, Roblox, Circle, Etsy, just to name a few. So they they had a lot of high-end clientele, for lack of a better word. Um, so today we're really going to dig into and talk about what happened today, why it happened, and what are some of those key government programs that really saved the bank's depositors from losing potentially billions of dollars overnight um, called deposit insurance? All right, great. I, I know this is the topic that has a lot of interest for myself and I'm sure our listeners as well, um, mm -hmm. because there's so much being said about it, but not a lot of really clear explanations for people outside of the financial business to understand what happened. So maybe, Mike, I'm going to throw it to you and maybe you can explain how this happens and, you know, what are, what are the sequence of events that creates a situation like this? Yes, certainly, Andy. Um, first of all, um, just to give you a general timeline of the events, uh, on Wednesday, March 9th, Silicon Valley Bank announced that it had sold several large securities at a loss and that it would sell 2.25 billion new shares to raise capital and shore up its balance sheet. So, with that being said, the, the securities or government securities that are, you know, relatively low risk investment and seemingly prudent thing to do with the extra cash until the Fed be, uh, began raising interest rates. And then suddenly, when that happened and they were longer term, uh, they were locked in for longer term, and that suddenly it meant that. Uh, the investment, um, you know, lost value in the market, and thus, uh, when they sold it, they would have to take a loss, um, you know, on it once again. So that was an immediate hit to their, uh, to their uh, balance sheet and their income statement. And 
While it's not uncommon for banks to take actions like this, it's really the, how the information was shared with the stock, the stakeholders that caused panic among the key venture capital firms and then reportedly advised the tech companies to withdraw their money from SVB. So, and then the next day on March 10th, there was a run on Silicon Valley Bank and others such as First Republic, PacWest, uh, Bank Corp and Signature Bank. Um, I believe Signature Bank is on the East Coast, but uh, these others are, are on the West Coast um, or San Francisco Bay Area or LA. So, and then what happened was a bank run is when a large number of customers withdraw sizable amounts of deposits in a short t- period of time. And then it creates a situation where the bank doesn't actually have the money on hand to give out because it's been invested elsewhere. And so that's, you know, the next stream. And so keep in mind that this is a very large bank, you know, over, you know, 200 and, um, I believe it was 230 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. And so very large. Um, and as opposed to just if you want to, for context, take First Alliance Credit Union, we are at roughly 285 million in assets. So just a fraction of that. But the the point is, is that this happened in a very short period of time where a, a number of these, uh, companies and customers that had very large balances uh, took out or withdrew funds all at once. And so this is happening almost overnight. And then you switch to Friday, March 11th, and then the, the bank's efforts to raise capital were halted by the federal regulators, and then the federal government stepped in and closed the bank. So literally overnight this happened. So um, it, So the takeover – put about $175 billion in customer deposits under the control of the federal regulator. And, of course, uh, this left the bank's customers wondering what the heck is going to happen to their money. Um, and so over the weekend, over that weekend, then, um, on Monday, March 13th, President Biden announced that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, would cover all of the customers' deposits, even above the normal $250,000 cap that is guaranteed. Uh, so it's so essential in the fact that that bank, as I keep emphasizing, went from fine to not fine in a matter of 48 hours due to, again, poor communication strategy, panic by their customers, investors, and the perfect storm of uh, the interest rates um, causing them, uh, you know, with the concentration risk of, of having to withdraw their or sell their securities at a loss in a time of, you know, long-term securities um, uh, in a very short period of time, and also the fact that the value had dropped because of the interest rates rising. So all of that happened um, in a very short period of time. Wow. So in essence, if the run on the bank hadn't occurred, they likely would have been able to weather this because they wouldn't have had to come up with that extra capital to cover the cash withdrawals. That is absolutely correct. Wow, that's wild. Are are these types of situations common? Is this, I guess, are we likely to see some more uh, of these bank failures? And um, I guess, you know, when you listen to the news coverage about what happened um, with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, are we looking at something as bad as 2008? What happened with the banking crisis? Um, in from all of the um, experts that um, you know, I've uh, consulted with our, our state state and national um, trade association that are very well you know dialed into and and have you know great relationships with the regulators themselves and legislators. Um, this is not you know again it, this is seen as a almost a perfect storm. Um, you know, could it happen? I mean, there's some ripple effect that we're seeing that maybe it's even a little surprising, but, um, you know, you've seen internationally, there were a couple Credit Swiss Bank of Switzerland was taken over by, um, you know, another large uh, Swiss bank. And then um, also um, you may have heard that after this collapse, some of the ripple effect was that Republic Bank in California um, actually um, had, um had a run on them per se, but a group, the, the Treasury Department got together with 
a group of the, of larger banks, uh, regionally or, or nationally for that matter, and they've all injected, um, you know, some cash into them. So even the system itself beyond the FDIC has, um, you know, bolstered them. So the short answer to that is no, it's not likely that this is definitely not anything like 2008, um, totally different causes. Uh, that was caused by the, you know, mortgage industry and the securities, uh, securitized, uh, mortgages, um, you know, that whole market collapsing and thus, and, you know, having to do with the intertwining of, of that and, and very complex securities. And that caused, you know, some banks to fail and also, or near failure, the, the government did step in. Uh, but the difference, the big difference, and I want to emphasize this to everybody, is that in that case, that was also taxpayer money that was lent to the banks. It was, you know, wasn't a, you know, necessarily a loan. I mean, it was more of a loan than a, you know, true bailout. But the fact is that was taxpayer money that was used. In this case, with this particular bank failure, which is, again, a pretty perfect storm because of the unique clientele um, in the tech industry that this bank was built over 40 years ago um, to serve and has served to them, you know, quite well. But um, so in this case, this is the insurance fund, the FDIC, the banking's insurance fund that insures depositors up to 250,000. But again, that that's the guarantee. But in this case, because it's a systemic failure, the, the government really wanted to avoid this. And it's not unusual that uh, when there is a bank failure, in fact, it's very common that, and it's not a bailout, it's just simply that, you know, the, the um, FDIC and the Treasury Department want to, again, um, stop a, a bank failure or at least mitigate it so that, you know, everybody's funds are, so-called bridged, if you will. So what happens is then the FDIC or the NCUA fund, if it was a credit union, but that's very unlikely, um, what happens is they bridge everybody's funds, their, their credit and, and their, their uh, deposits so that somebody will come along and buy the, you know, the assets and liabilities of the institution and therefore keep the depositors whole. Sure. Uh, no matter what size their deposit is. It's the guarantee, obviously. But, again, that's if a total failure happened. And, you know, again, this was um, doing exactly what it's designed to do, and that's to save, you know, the depositors all their money, not just the, the 250. So all right. uh, that's what it's designed to do. Okay, Mike we and Jenna, we have to take a quick break. We're talking about the uh, Silicon Valley bank collapse and, why it happened um, <laughs> and why it's not as bad as what we had in 2008. We'll return in a moment with more of Good Money Moves right here on News Talk 1340, KROC AM and 96.9 FM. Good Money Moves continues in moments with Andy Brownell and Jenna Tobel from First Alliance Credit Union. This is News Talk 1340, KROC AM and 96.9 FM. <laughs> We're talking Good Money Moves with Andy Brownell and Jenna Tobel from First Alliance Credit Union on Rochester's News Talk, 1340 KROC AM and 96.9 FM. We are back with Good Money Moves. Mike Rosick and Jenna Tobel with First Alliance Credit Union with us. Mike, the CEO at First Alliance. We're talking about the Silicon Valley bank collapse and the ramifications of it. You had mentioned earlier, Mike, that this SBB out in California had a a different type of clientele. Maybe you can explain more of why that made its operations probably a little bit more risky than the average institution. Yes, yes. Um, you know, again, we we talked, you know, just briefly about why there was a difference. You know, why with this situation versus the. 2008 crisis and you know again the 2008 crisis was centered around risky real estate lending for several years and you know some of those types of things but this one the silicon valley situation silicon valley bank situation is different um, it was a very unique bank and it caters specifically to tech and healthcare startups and you know other banks might have found this these types uh, of customers too risky you know there's inherent 
apparently more risk in a startup than established business. And, you know, you heard Jenna talk earlier about some of the companies. I mean, at one time they were all startups and now they've, of course, grown to be successful. But um, all of those, again, have, um, you know, worked with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, it also, again, because of the type of clientele that it was, it was very um undiversified, if, if we can say that, um, you know, most of their clientele repli- relied heavily on venture capital funding. And so when the bank announced that it was trying to raise capital to cover the $2 billion loss, it made that announcement without a lot of context. And it spooked some venture capitalist into thinking that the bank was in trouble. And then, um, you know, those VCs or those venture capitalists in turn advised their tech companies to start pulling the money out of the bank. And then suddenly, you know, it became, you know, more of a reality that, heck, it isn't because, you know, again, it induced those, you know, people. And that just had that kind of domino effect, which, again, is is very scary. And, you know, so it doesn't mean that banks can't fail. But uh, so in an extraordinary move, the FDIC shut down the bank, you know, midday Friday, and, and usually the bank or usually the FDIC will close a bank at, you know, at 5 p.m. when it's planned in advance. But it had become so rapidly insolvent that they said the FDIC couldn't wait any longer. And so at the time of closure, about 25 percent of their deposits had been withdrawn from the bank in a 48 hour wow. time frame, which is stunning. That's crazy. Now, you mentioned the FDIC earlier. And how it was saving the depositors from losing their money after the collapse of the bank. Maybe delve into it more deeply, Mike. What is the FDIC and and what does it do? And are credit unions covered under the same sort of system? Um, the FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And it's been around for many years, um, even preceding the uh, credit union fund. Um, but it's it's an independent government agency that oversees the banking industry, and its primary duty is to ensure that deposits at U.S. member banks, in case they fail. Um, so, in addition to provide a, the deposit insurance, it also supervises and examines banks and, and savings associations across the country to make sure that they're operating soundly and comply with consumer protection laws. And so. Credit unions have the same protection oversight, but through a different independent government agency called the National Credit Union Administration. And so um, the NCUA and the FDIC insure deposit accounts, including checking, savings, money markets, CDs, cashier's checks, money orders, and other official items issued by the bank. But they do not insure investments such as stocks and bonds and investment accounts. Um, right. And the standard insurance through both of these agencies is 250000 per depositor, per account, ownership type, per financial institution. And so uh, the, the consumers don't have to do anything to take advantage of this coverage. And if you have your deposits at an insured financial institution, you're automatically covered. And um, so, again, the banks and credit unions pay a premium to the NCUA and the FDIC for this coverage, but the consumers and translate that to taxpayers pay nothing for this, um, you know, for this coverage. Um, and if the bank fails, you get your, your deposits are covered on a dollar for dollar basis, including the principal and interest accrued through the date of default. So if a person were lucky enough through their fortune to have more than $250,000 they they could go to another institution and once again get the same coverage for another account? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So that's the wisdom there, that if you, <laughs> you wouldn't want to put more than that into a single account in one institution. If Yes, if, you know, that's, that's the real smart way to do it. And, you know, one of the things here, one of the lessons here too is, um, you know, diversification um, goes a long way both, on a personal basis and also on an institutional basis. And, you know, those were some things, again, some of the unique uh, characteristics of Silicon Valley Bank, which 
you know, again, obviously failed. Um, and there could, maybe there'll be some legislation that comes out of this, um, you know, to cover this or t- to try to prevent something like this happening again. I mean, there's obviously the, um, you know, the uh, FDIC um, has its, you know, coverage in place, but in terms of, um, you know, a future event, you know, we may see some of it, but this takes, you know, unfortunately it happened so fast, but the, you know, post-mortem of this and the, um, you know, what comes next sometimes can take years to unravel. So, um, sure. you know, that's again, another one of the scary things, but again, the biggest thing to know is a, it's not taxpayer money that's bailing it out. It's the, you know, the bank fund itself and that, you know, but it did prove again that customers and members' money are safe in a, a failure and, and covered in a failure, even, you know, beyond, you know, the government does not want anybody to lose any money. And so even beyond the guarantees that they were given. In essence, the system worked. Absolutely. Exactly. All right. Mike Rosick is with us, CEO of First Alliance Credit Union, along with Jenna Taubel. And we have to take another quick break. We'll return in a moment on News Talk 1340, KROC AM and 96.9 FM. Good Money Moves continues in moments with Andy Brownell and Jenna Tobel from First Alliance Credit Union. This is News Talk 1340, KROC AM and 96.9 FM. We're to- with Andy Brownell and Jenna Tobble from First Alliance Credit Union on Rochester's News Talk, 1340 KROC AM and 96.9 FM. Welcome back to Good Money Moves. Jenna Tobble with First Alliance Credit Union along with First Alliance CEO Mike Rosick with us this morning. We've been talking about the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, I guess, Mike, what differentiates a bank from a credit union when it comes to protecting somebody's deposits there's uh, there's some structural differences there's there's not a lot but um the the main so there's structural differences between a credit union a bank and how the credit union structure provides better protection for members Uh, first of all um you know we're we're for i mean banks are for profit credit unions are not for profit um they have banks have stockholders credit unions are um, have member owners, so it's a cooperative. Um, and so, again, the members are the actual owners. Um, there are no stockholders that, you know, again, sometimes, you know, the for-profit, um, to, you know, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but that for-profit, um, you know, motive sometimes, um, you know, tries to, the, the stockholders and the stock price is the, is the, you know, kind of the target to get, um, you know, better earnings and things like that. And so a lot of times you'll see, um, you know, some higher fees and some things like that, um, you know, that tend to perpetuate in banks. The liquidity, our capital, our diversification requirements, I think are different, are stronger, um, are more stringent. Um, And again, you know, we have the member focused philosophy, which is to, you know, benefit, uh, each and every member owner that that's the reason why we exist. We don't have the profit motive, um, you know, as do the banks. And, you know, again, it's a, you know, we need a healthy banking system, just like we need, um, you know, healthy credit unions. Um, uh, you know, the 5,000 credit unions roughly in the country are, you know, overwhelmingly strong, um, as are, you know, most of the banking system, but those are some of the differences, if you will, um, as to, you know, what, what the difference sure. is between uh, us, between the credit union and the bank when it comes to protecting, you know, the money, their their funds. Is there anything else that our listeners should be, should know about this, about either the collapse of the bank or the share situation or insurance or or even credit unions that we haven't covered yet? Um, I would just say, again, um, just be aware that – or just be aware that your money is safe in a bank or credit union um, and that it's not to panic because everything is well under control. We're, you know, the banking system is sound. There have been some ripple effects. Obviously, this was a big deal, but – 
Um, it's overall, the, the overall system is strong, uh, thanks to the, uh, you know, the regulations and the FDIC fund as our credit unions are very strong. And, um, again, our, uh, deposit insurance is very strong and your money's safe. And all those people on Silicon Valley who had money in that bank, they all got it. Exactly. All, yeah. None of it disappeared on them. Absolutely not. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. And as usual, time is running out for us. I wish we could continue talking about this topic. Mike, thank you again for joining us. I look forward to the next time you can be with us. Absolutely, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. And Jenna, I'm going to turn it to you to provide us with some more resources if somebody wants to dig deeper into, you know, the NCUA or the FDIC and the banking system. Yeah. Well, as always, I encourage our listeners to visit our website, firstalliancecu.com. We do have more information about the NCUA Share Insurance in our resource center on our website. We have a blogs about it. We've got all kinds of resources available um, around NCUA share insurance. And of course, um, speaking of our blog, you can subscribe to our blog. Um, We do release new financial tips and advice every week for our subscribers. And then please go back and listen to past episodes of this show at firstalliancecu.com slash podcast or on carocnews.com. You can also subscribe to Good Money Moves on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. And of course, I strongly encourage you to meet with our member advisors here at First Alliance Credit Union. They are here to help you get pointed in the right financial direction, no matter what your financial goals are. That's First Alliance Credit Union, federally insured by NCUA and an equal housing lender. Mike Rosick, John Tobel with First Alliance Credit Union with us today. I'm Andy Brownell. And this has been Good Money Moves on News Talk 1340, KROC AM and 96.9.